before I continue. Here we go. As we open up our shared time together this evening, we acknowledge that most all of us gathered in this virtual space and the bodies in which we reside are currently resting on the traditional lands of the Western Abenaki people. This land has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples who have stewarded these lands for many generations. Let us hold gratitude for the land upon which we gather virtually this evening and pay respect to our Abenaki neighbors and their elders, both past and present. As Fred said, I am the Reverend Joan Javier Duval. I serve as minister of the Unitarian Church of Montpelier and as president of the board of Vermont Interfaith Action. In whatever way is fitting for you, I invite you now into a short time of reflection and centering. Take a deeper breath, place a hand on your heart, bring your spirit into deeper union with the divine. Here we are connected across distance and devices. We bring our grief, our rage, our yearning, and our hope of this day. We arrive accompanied by other blessed souls and by a love and mystery beyond our understanding. We come together this evening because we know the importance and the necessity of a roof over one's head. We know the urgent need of a place to inhabit with dignity and safety. In this time that we are gathered, may we listen deeply. May we be open to our questions and to solutions that we might find surprising. May we allow ourselves to be stirred beyond complacency and onto a meaningful path forward, knowing all along that we do this together and with a divine collaborator who holds us and prods us towards an ever more just world. Amen and blessed be. Thank you, Reverend Joan. I forgot to unmute myself. Again, my name is Fred Brunig. I'm the moderator of Guilford Community Church, United Church of Christ, and a member of the statewide organizing committee on affordable housing and homelessness. I'm also a member of the Vermont Interfaith Action Board. We're delighted that you have joined us tonight. I ask everyone now to please take a minute and introduce yourself in the chat function, giving your name and town and any affiliation you have, whether business or organization or faith community. And uh, please note that we are recording the event tonight. We extended personal invitations to all members of the House and Senate Appropriations Committees. Uh, we give special thanks and welcome to those who are going to be joining us tonight. Um, I'll be saying a little bit more, more about that in a moment. But uh, among the members who we were unable to entice here tonight are Senate Appropriations Chair Jane Kitchell, Senators Dick Sears, Robert Starr, Richard Westman, and Phil Baruth. On the House side, Vice Chair Peter Fagan, Ranking Member Kimberly Jessup, and Representatives Marty Feltus and Bob Helm. But we did want to thank the legislators who were planning to join us tonight. Uh, at this point, we were going to introduce them individually, but we just got word not just, I think it was about a half an hour ago that the House is still in session. They uh, recessed uh, briefly and then went back into session at 610. So the House members, uh, seven House members that we were expecting uh, tonight will not be with us. Uh, our two senators uh, that, that had agreed to join uh, with us tonight uh, had a, a special caucus that, um, that will um, take them until seven o'clock. So we hope that they'll still be, uh, they won't be zoomed out and will be able to join us at seven. 
but I would like to um, list all of those people who we were planning on having. Uh, who, uh, one uh, Senate President Pro Tem, who also serves on the Senate Appropriations Committee, Senator Becca Ballant, will hopefully be here later. Vice Chair of Senate Appropriations, Alice Nitka, was also going to be joining us. From House Appropriations, we were uh, planning on seeing Representative James Harrison, the Chair of the Committee, Representative Mary Hooper, Representative Robin Shai, Representative Trevor Squirrel, Representative Tristan Tolino, the Clerk of the Committee, Representative Maida Townsend, and Representative David Yacobone. We, uh, I do, I wanted to thank them all for taking the time that they were going to spend with us to be with us tonight um, and um, tell them that we are grateful for the work they do for our state on the appropriations committees. We know that serving on these committees is a significant responsibility in terms of knowledge of state programs, expertise in financial management, and commitment to the well being of all Vermonters. The budget, the budget process is always important, and I'm sure it can also be tedious and time consuming, but probably never no more so than in a pandemic. Their deliberations and decisions have perhaps never been more impactful as we pull the state out of this challenging time and into a new future. One of the elements of coping with COVID that made a strong impression on members of Vermont Interfaith Action was the rapid and comprehensive way that our neighbors who all over the state who were experiencing homelessness were provided shelter to keep them safe from the virus. This demonstrated to us how true it is that where there's a will, there's a way. And then we reasoned if the state can step up and house those in need in an urgent manner, why can we not build on that to create long-term solutions to our housing problems? To test this theory and look for solutions, we conducted extensive research with many authorities and decision makers throughout Vermont over the past year. We will be presenting our complete research report in a few minutes, which includes our ideas for how to make housing and particularly rental housing more prevalent and accessible to those who need it. These ideas require to one degree or another funding from the state government in order to make them a real reality, which is why we had chosen the uh, Appropriations Committee members to be with us tonight because they control the state purse strings. Uh, we wanted to share our ideas with them, recognizing that uh, they came to their role because they, as we, care deeply about Vermonters and we are convinced that they too want to create a state where everyone can feel safe can find safe, affordable housing so that they can flourish and thrive as individuals and as families. We expect that on these values and principles, we will all find agreement and that any matters of disagreement will come only from policy approaches and decision-making details. So we wanted them to know that we respect them and the work they do, but as their constituents, we also believe that we have a right and a duty to share our concerns and ideas clearly and emphatically, which is what we plan to do tonight. We also wanted to view, to view this event as the start of a collaborative process in which we all continue to share our thinking on how our housing system can be improved and then work together to make those improvements happen. In addition to our legislative guests, we are also asked several people who have personal experiences with the challenges of finding housing in the state to share their stories with us. And uh, we will meet them shortly. We're so grateful for their willingness to be here tonight. So that everyone can see where we're headed with our agenda, our Zoom administrator is placing it now in the chat and a word about how this will work. Um, we have, do have a lot to cover in a short, short amount of time. So we are only inviting those on the agenda to speak. Uh, those who are sharing their personal stories will each have two to three minutes to talk about their experiences. After our research report, we will ask questions of our legislators about proposals we're making. We're 
asking these, we're asking them to please answer these initial questions with a simple yes or no answer. After the questions have been po posed, each of them will be given some time to elaborate on their answers and share their thinking about these issues. Our timekeeper, Sue Dallas Piscoli, will, will make sure we stay on time and she will let um, our legislators know that their speaking time is coming to an end by holding up a yellow warning sign. And they will then have a half a minute to, to uh, wrap up their remarks at the end of their time. She will <laughs> hold up a red stop sign to in indicate that our guest's time has ended. All of our guests have been informed prior to the event about these ground rules and have agreed to the structure of tonight's meeting. So we'll move on <clears throat> to the next item in our agenda. Uh, now we'll have one of our Vermont Interfaith Action leaders give tonight's VIA credential. Virginia. Hello, my name is Virginia Monkowitz and I'm a member of Christ Church Presbyterian. Vermont Interfaith Action is a grassroots faith-based coalition, coalition of six C8 member and affiliated congregations throughout Vermont, working together to affect systemic change around issues of social justice, particularly trying to increase access to affordable housing and to eradicate homelessness. Since the pandemic struck, we have witnessed how quickly precariously housed Vermonters were given safe, decent places to stay. We would like to ensure that this care for our homeless neighbors is combined with long-term increases in affordable housing so that we can, as a state, permanently address our housing problems. Thank you, Virginia. Next, uh, we're going to have a roll call of faith communities present, and I believe we're gonna to go to um, uh, gallery view uh, for that so that uh, when your uh, faith community is um, mentioned, please um, you know, wave or do something um, to indicate that you're here. Um, Marty, can you uh, yes. take care um, of that? Am I on? Yes, I'm Marty Roberts. I'm a member of Christ Episcopal Church in Montpelier and a member of the board of directors of Vermont Interfaith Action. And I, um, this evening, we want to welcome you all and re recognize the people who have come from our member congregations. When I call out your faith community, please click on the thumbs up button under reactions or just give a wave to indicate that you're, you're here. And feel free to unmute yourself and make some noise. Church of the Good Shepherd, Barry. Christ Episcopal Church, Montpelier. First Presbyterian Church, Barry. Barry Con Congregational Church. Unitarian Church of Montpelier. Any other congregations or folks from Central Vermont? Ah, Hi. Ms. Nancy. Um, Bethany Church in Montpelier. Good. Um, Christ Church Presbyterian in Burlington. First Unitarian Universalist Society of Burlington. First Congregational Church of Burlington. Okay. Um, College Street Congregational Church. <laughs> Any other congregations or folks from the greater Burlington area? Burlington Friends Meeting. There's three of us here. Ah, oh, Javi Zedek Synagogue. Temple Sinai. Oh, also, gathering. St. <laughs> Paul's Episcopal Cathedral. Hey. Um, Sisters of Mercy. <laughs> oh, welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to see you. Um, the West Brattleboro Quaker. Uh, worship group. We're here. You there? Center Congregational Church in Brattleboro. The Congregational Church of Westminster West, United Church of 
of Christ. Nice to see you all. All Souls Unitarian Universalist Church of Brattleboro. The Guilford Community Church, United Church of Christ. There you are. Thank you all. Any other congregations or folks from Wyndham County? St. Michael's Episcopal Church, Brattleboro. Welcome. St. Barnabas Episcopal Church in North Vermont from Windsor County. Windsor. <laughs> Welcome. And First Congregational Church of Thetford. St. Paul's Episcopal Church in White River Junction. And any other congregations or folks from the Upper Valley? Okay, we're, all, we're glad to see you tonight and welcome you to the program. Great, thank you, Marty. Um, uh, next on the agenda is our research report. We have compiled a great deal of research over the last year and we'd like to share a summary of that work. Beth Ann, you're on. Thank you. I'm Beth Ann Mayer. I'm a deacon in the Episcopal churches in Montpelier and Barrie. And we call this a research report. But if there's one thing we've learned uh, in our recent research, it's just how rapidly the ground shifts with the breathtaking amount of money that is in play this year. First with the CARES Act, then the surprise of the state revenue surplus, the American Rescue Plan Act, and hopefully still to come President Biden's huge infrastructure bill, the American Jobs Plan. It has been a tremendously challenging but pleasant task to begin dreaming of the real possibilities for change that these funds present. So at the very start, we take our hats off to you, the members of the House and Senate Appropriations Committee, wherever you are right now in your various duties, for vigorously <coughs> moving ahead and attempting to put together an unprecedented once in a lifetime state budget to address the backlog of needs in this state with very little idea of the federal guidelines governing the ARPA funds and no real certainty that more big money is coming our way. We also thank you for rapidly providing COVID-19 safe shelter in motels across the state for those who had no homes and were doubled up in friends' homes or in crowded shelters when the stay-at-home order was issued. You can take pride in Ben Truman's report from the Vermont Department of Health that there have not been any COVID-19 related deaths among the more than 5,700 Vermonters who have spent time in emergency motel or shelter housing in the past year. And we are grateful for the 450 units of housing that were created through the distribution of CARES Act funding and the 25 million designated for rent and mortgage arrearages to prevent evictions and foreclosures. And the 15 million for housing retention services, all of this reported by Representative Tom Stevens in his committee. So we stand before you with awe and gratitude at what you have done. And this should not surprise you, we are going to ask you to do so much more. We are going to ask you to dream big and make it possible for every Vermonter to have a permanent, stable, and safe housing. We are going to ask you to make it possible to end homelessness in Vermont. It is within our grasp. We can do this. Right now, there are about 2,700 Vermonters without permanent housing residing in roughly 75 motels across the state. Over 400 of them are children. Imagine the long-term effects of spending a year in a motel room. It could be half your life if you're a two-year-old. Playing, eating, sleeping, being rowdy, making a mess, testing limits, attending online school if you are an older child, with your stressed out siblings and parents in the room with you all the time. 2,700 people over 400 children. The pandemic has brought these numbers to light, but the pandemic did not cause their homelessness. We have known for years that the point in time count of those experiencing homelessness on just one single night in January 
has been grossly undercounting the number of people without stable permanent housing. We have known that the number of people without housing who have enrolled in our coordinated entry systems around the state, which is how you enter housing, has been much, much higher than the annual point in time count. The pandemic and the state's commitment to provide COVID safe shelter has brought people out of crowded, doubled up living arrangements, out of substandard housing with no heat exposed electrical wiring and backed up sewage out of a, abusive households where they had no choice but to subsist until they could win the lottery on the coordinated entry list. Where else could they go? According to the annual HUD op Housing Opportunity Program 2020 report, the shelters were at capacity prior to the pandemic. And the average length of stay in homeless shelters was at its highest level in more than 18 years prior to the pandemic. We were only providing 28 days of emergency hotel shelter, even though we knew that the average time from becoming homeless and entering the coordinated entry system to entering permanent housing was 125 days, an average of four months from the time you become homeless to the time you're able to enter housing. It is time to ask ourselves, how did we get here? Why could they not find housing? Housing is one of the most basic needs of life. It is right there at the very foundation of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, air, water, food, and shelter. What are we doing as a state if we are not preserving the systems that meet the most basic needs of our citizens. What the pandemic has brought to light is the degree to which we have negligently underinvested in our housing system. By state statute, 50% of the funds raised through the property transfer tax is designated for use by the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, which is the source of affordable housing in our state. For every VHCB dollar invested, approximately four more dollars are invested from other sources, often private investors and lenders, that can be applied to the development of affordable housing in Vermont. The VHCB can turn one dollar into five dollars. But we have not fully funded this statutory obligation for any of the last 20 years. Yes, we had a $35 million housing bond in 2017. Yes, there have been general bond funds through the annual state capital budget. If these are added in, they do not come close to matching 20 years of the lost statutory funding that should come through the property transfer tax. Funds from the property transfer tax come to VHCB free of obligation Funds obtained through bonding come with all the debt costs attached to a bond, and bonded funds are not able to access the full range of developer financing that is available to unbonded funds. Year after year, we have failed to fully invest in securing safe and affordable housing for our citizens. According to the 2020 Vermont Housing Needs Assessment Report, we have produced only a small number of new homes in the last two decades. In the 1980s, Vermont's housing growth rate was 1.8%. But from 2010 to 2017, which is the last year we have data, it grew by just an average of 419 homes a year, or 0.16%, a tenth of the previous rate. By national standards, Vermont homes are aging and in need of repair. Over 36% of our rental housing was built before 1939. Based on HUD projections, Vermont will lose 2,500 units of housing over the next five years due to destruction or conversion to another use. Close to 20,000 Vermont households live in homes with serious housing quality issues. But we only know that from US Census data we don't know the true number and condition of our rental housing stock because we have not had a registry of rental housing 
or a statewide inspection system to ascertain whether the state code of standards for rental housing are being met. We do know that whether to purchase or to rent, available housing is very scarce. We have all heard stories of houses that are being purchased sight unseen with bids well above the asking price. It is equally difficult to find a home to rent. In 2010, the Vermont rental vacancy rate was 7%. Seven years later, in 2017, it had dropped to 3.3% statewide and around 2% in our most populated counties like Chittenden County and Washington County. A rate around five to 6% is considered a healthy rental vacancy rate. A low vacancy rate, a low vacancy rental rate represents housing scarcity and drives the cost of rent upward. And we saw the median gross rent in Vermont climb $100, a 12% increase as the rental vacancy rate dropped from 7% to 3.3% over those seven years. Among the people lodged in motels, as many as 200 have rental vouchers in hand, but can find no place to rent. There are vanishingly few rental units open and even fewer that will accept the level of rent that the vouchers will pay. The vouchers have a maximum payout that is supposedly set at a fair market rate, but the voucher payout has not kept pace with the prevailing rents in the community so that many landlords will no longer accept the vouchers. As housing costs have steadily risen, wages have not. Over one third of all households in Vermont fall into the cost burden designation. That is 36% of all households in Vermont are spending more than 30% of their income on housing and 16% are spending more than 50% of their income on housing costs. So please remember that the next time we have a chance to raise the minimum wage. The 2020 Housing Needs Assessment Report also brings to light the shameful legacy of systemic racism with respect to housing. A disproportionate number of people identified as minorities are homeless in Vermont. A 2019 document from the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance states that while 3% of Chittenden County residents are Black and 5% of residents living in poverty are Black, 14% of those experiencing homelessness are Black. We applaud the legislature for committing itself to searching out the racist policies and decisions that throughout our history have erected barriers to the equitable distribution of wealth and opportunity. Our housing system is a glaring example of the disparities resulting from inequitable policies, from the very early discovery land claims of the early white settlers, to the racial discrimination of the GI housing bill and redlining of the 1940s and 50s, and discriminatory loan practices of recent decades. We now have the opportunity to make some real gains in not only dismantling unfair practices, but ensuring a path forward for those who have been denied opportunity for so long. Many interest groups come before you with excellent, well-supported concerns, such as expanding the reach of broadband, upgrading the unstable IT systems of our state services, preserving the health of our institutions of higher education, all very worthy concerns but certainly our very first priority must be to ensure that the systems that provide our most basic needs for food, water, and safe shelter are sufficient to provide for all Vermonters. We have been deficient in meeting the need for shelter over the last two decades. We are now blessed with the opportunity to correct that deficiency. Not only is it the morally right thing to do, but it is also the economically right thing to do. A growing body of evidence has revealed that providing stable housing reduces the downstream costs of poor physical and mental health 
substance use disorders, educational support for students whose primary challenge is chaos and trauma, and ultimately the cost in our criminal justice and correction systems related to living homeless. The state will spend twice as much responding to the challenges of people who are chronically homeless than it will when providing housing and support to assist them in moving from homelessness into permanent housing. We will spend twice as much if we don't do it now. The current budget proposal passed by the House and under consideration in the Senate Appropriations Committee allocates $50 million to increase the number of affordable housing units in Vermont. Honestly, in any other year, we would be ecstatic. Governor Scott's pro budget proposal would allocate $249 million for this purpose, five times as much. The House budget figure might potentially add 1,200 units of housing. The governor's proposal would add 5,000 units of housing. The Vermont Roadmap to End Homelessness report, which was published over four years ago now, called for the creation of 3,148 units of affordable housing to end homelessness in Vermont. Considering what we now know about the true number of people living in shelter and motels, as well as the number of units likely to be removed from our occupied housing stock over the next four years, plus the projected growth expected in the number of households in Vermont, the house budget falls far short of the need. And Governor Scott's desire to create 5,000 units is a very reasonable goal. So we ask you, one, to commit the funds needed to create 5,000 units of housing as soon as possible, and then fully fund the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board each year until we have created enough affordable housing to enable all our citizens to be permanently housed. Two, address racial disparity in housing distribution by fully funding a pathway for housing opportunities that is inclusive, accessible, and accommodating. Three, fully fund S79 to establish a rental housing registry and inspection system throughout the state to ensure the safety of our rental housing stock. And finally, but most importantly, four, establish and fund a comprehensive plan to support all Vermonters experiencing homelessness, providing them with safe and humane emergency shelter and the economic and human service support that will allow them to, to achieve long lasting, stable, permanent and safe housing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Beth Ann, for that excellent report. Um, you've given us a detailed overall picture and highlighted the systemic issues that we need to address. Before we go on, I see that Senator Alice Nitka has joined us. Thank you for, for coming and welcome. Um, perhaps you could unmute and uh, just say hello and tell us what uh, district you represent. Hi, I'm Alice Nitka. Uh, I represent the Windsor District which is all of Windsor County and the towns of Londonderry in Wyndham County and the town of Mount Holly in Rutland County. Um, I'm a member of the Appropriations Committee and the Judiciary Committee in the Senate. And thank you for inviting me. I, I, I'm here late because I had to be at another Zoom meeting uh, prior to this, thanks. We, we, were, uh, we were informed of the, the other meeting and I guess uh, Senator Ballant must still be there. Yes, <laughs> or, maybe. Or maybe she's getting. She's, she's yeah. coming. She's just coming on, Fred. Oh, great, great, great. There were several well, meetings this evening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's. Um, uh, Senator Ballant, um, can you, if you're, if you're there, can, can you say hello? I can hear you, Fred. Nice to see you. Great. Nice to be here. Sounds like the Senate came through. When the house was occupied, just want to make note of that. Senate was here. 
When the house let you down, just remember that. Okay. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's not as though they're eating bonbons with their feet up. On I the know, I know, but they, you know, I just got to get it in when I can because we're usually on the receiving end. So. Fair enough. <laughs> um, well, you'll, uh, Senator Ballant, you'll need to um, read the uh, research report that Beth Ann just gave. It was uh, quite extensive and excellent, but I wanted to move on, move on to um, the next. Fred, uh, oh, Fred, sorry. If I could, just to let you know, I knew that I was going to be late and, and Debbie sent it to me so I could read it right before I came on. So excellent. just Great. wanted you to know that. So you were doing your homework while we were listening to the report. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, I wanted to say to, to move on though and say that beyond behind this research are the lives and stories of those who experience homelessness and insecure housing on a daily basis. And we are fortunate to have with us this evening several neighbors who um, will tell us the story of how they have faced housing challenges in their lives. Thank you, Tina, Tammy, Iris, and Sean for being here. And um, it looked like you were on the screen there for a minute. Are you, are, do we have, do we have the, the uh, screen for, for Tina, Tammy, Iris, and Sean? I think they're all on one computer. Where did they go? There they are. So um, if you uh, could unmute yourself, uh, we're ready to, hear your, about your experiences. Can you? Tina, can you hear me? Or? Looks like she was frozen. Uh-huh. Yeah, Fred, I think that we just lost signal again with them. So we'll see if we can get them back on. Can they uh, can they call in? Uh, did they call in on the phone? Did I understand that Carl is, is there trying to help with tech issues? He was. Looks like he's I'll not. Give the, I'll give them a call. Yeah, if they could just call in on the phone, if Melissa can give you that number, at least that would be something. Okay, well, um, let's see. Um, it's been, it's been kind of a Murphy's Law kind of a kind of an evening. <laughs> yeah, it has. Uh, <laughs> but we had we had uh, seven members of the House uh, Appropriations Committee that had committed to being here tonight, and then got word that they uh, uh, their session the House session was um, continuing into the evening tonight. So we're missing all of them, but. Certainly appreciate our two committed senators for being here. Um, I don't think I want to keep going here to um, without because um, the next thing we were do is going to um, ask our questions of our guests from the legislature. But I think it would be good to hear hear the testimony from our folks in the motel program. We'll give them another another minute. Yes, I'm joining you, Fred, so you don't feel oh. so all alone. Um, <laughs> Hi folks, I'm Debbie Ingram. I'm the Executive Director of Vermont Interfaith Action. And we really do appreciate your being, being here tonight. And uh, we appreciate your patience um, as well. Uh, Fred's doing a terrific job under, under duress uh, here, but um, I think, yeah, he's absolutely right. It's so important to hear the stories of people who are directly affected by the issues that we work on. And uh, for VIA, that's a very important part of our model. Um, we try to uh, both be very accurate about our research and uh, Beth Ann did a terrific job on the research report. Um, but also, you know, we always want to um, highlight the folks who are um, behind the statistics and the data and the research, uh, the people who are, uh, whose lives are, um, you know, um, well, who have the lived experience of, of the issues that we're, that we're talking about. So um, we've been trying to, um, 
to get them on, um, uh, you know, on Wi-Fi. Um, they are staying at, at one of the motels. Uh, so you're actually getting a bit of um, an impression of what life is like yeah. um, at, you know, at the motels. Um, so. Um, Looks like Beth Ann is still on the phone there. Yeah, a little. But. While we're waiting, um, earlier this uh, in the evening, we asked folks if they could put their names um, as well as uh, what either faith community or if you're if you're with an organization, um, another organization into the chat box along with where you're located. And this kind of helps us know who has attended. So if you haven't had a chance to do that, um, please do that now. Um, and you can you can just drop that into the chat box if you have a chance. Thank you, Melissa. That's our tech administrator here, Melissa Bata. Um, Beth Ann, did you have a report for us? I think you unmuted there for a second. Um, I've not been able to reach them on the phone. I, I spent two hours with these uh, wonderful people this afternoon, and they have amazing stories to tell. I wish we had them with us, but uh, they're connection just doesn't seem to be working and uh, and now I can't reach them on the phone. Uh, I can give you a little preview maybe. I, it's not as much as them telling their stories, but one is a, a woman who came uh, to take care of her very premature grandson and uh, to be a help to that young family and they uh, she was essential to, to that child's survival and their, their ability to work. And she lived with them for several years supporting that child. Um, she's taken care of other people. And in all this time of being a caregiver, she has never uh, been able to get the kind of uh, benefits that everybody else gets. And so when the time came, uh, she was left without housing. Uh, and that could be any of us. Uh, another woman who uh, needs the emotional support of her pet and she was unable to find any housing that would allow her to have her pet. And so she lived in her car uh, and has been homeless for six years. Um, and another woman who uh, she and her husband are both disabled and um, have had a very difficult path navigating housing. Uh, I mean, their stories are, uh, could be the stories of any of us. Uh, and I so wish they could be with us, but I think we should probably go forward okay. in the program. Okay, uh, well, thank you for your efforts there, Beth Ann, to well, both in con connecting with those folks and, and also um, being able to hear their stories can give us a little bit of taste of, of um, what they might have had to say. It looks like you're about to say something else. I saw I saw their name flash across the the people online. I just don't know that it's going to be uh, something that I don't know if they can hold the connection. And it's not there now. Uh huh. Okay. Well. Um, I guess we'll move on. Um, uh, right. could, I, could I jump in here for a second? Just, sure, just to let you know, as, as legislators, and so I, I'm Senator Rebecca Bell and I represent Wyndham County. I sit on the committee of jurisdiction that, that oversees issues of housing. And so I just wanna reassure you that part of the work that we do in the legislature is hearing every single session from people directly impacted by the programs that, that we set up and that we finance. And so I just wanna make sure that, that Debbie knows this, but I just wanna make sure that you all understand that you tried really, really hard that, so that we could hear their stories directly. And I just want you to know that um, we do hear regularly from people who are experiencing um, trauma of, of all, all sorts here in Vermont. And so, acutely aware of those stories and we carry them with us into our committees every day and it shapes the work that we do. So I don't want Debbie to feel like she has she has failed in any way. 
Um, and I know how this goes. And it is a great um, apt representation of what it actually means to be living on the margins and living in a motel. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Senator, Senator Bellin. Um, well, I think we will move forward then. Um, yep. We had four questions at the end of um, the research report that um, we will pose again, one at a time. And um, we'd like each of you to respond with a, a, a simple yes or no question to begin with. And then following the last question, each of you will have some time to elaborate on your answers and present some of your own thinking. So um, after Marty, if you could unmute and ask the first question and I'll um, call on you alphabetically. So Senator Ballant, you'll it's be- It's gonna take me a bit to, to find it here. I guess we uh, sprung that on you a little bit to uh, since you were expecting to hear hear from the folks that were in the motel program. I, I, I guess I'd like to say that I'm not sure I'm going to be answered yes or no to the questions if I have them all. I was writing them down as they were presented and certainly want to have them in mind, but I don't believe I'm going to be saying yes or no to as a response to them. I, I'm not in a position to do that. Um, the Appropriations Committee has a very deliberative process and many things have to be weighed. So I don't feel that I can say yes or no to any of these. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you about the concern for the homeless and always have felt that way. I was a social worker myself for 27 years, 27 years in one job and then um, many years after that in another position. So I do know, um, you know, what people are dealing with, but still, I mean, a very, the report was done very well I would like to have a copy of it. I don't have one. And maybe you've sent it to me, but maybe I didn't see it. But um, I would like to have a copy of it. It had some very good information in it. Certainly. So. Well, um, if you don't mind, we'll proceed with our format. And um, you can, um, we, very you've, well. said, you've said your piece here, but we'll give you a chance to speak um, more afterwards anyway. So. Uh, Question number one, Marty, do you have that? There? I'm sorry, I can't find it here. Fred, I could do that one. Marty, it's, it's in the chat box. If you look in the chat box, I just sent it to you. And this is Carl, and I'm here with the stories too. Oh. <laughs> well, okay. Well, let's, um, let's, let's uh, go back and pick up uh, with Carl and, and the folks. Are you at the motel, Carl? I'm, I'm afraid that we might lose sen uh, the senators, though. Or, uh, I'm not sure how long you can stay on. So why? It's why okay, Debbie. I think we should hear from them. Okay. I think we should hear from them. Okay, terrific. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for your patience. And then, um, uh, Carl. Yes, if you have if you have our folks, then yep. go ahead. I think we're good. Thanks so much. Great. Good thank evening. You, good evening. My name is Tammy Menard. Um, I'm a homeless person. Uh, homeless and domestic violence survivor who is currently being home housed in the hotel in the Barry Montpelier area. I have been a peer support volunteer for the last six years and recently I have started doing independent advocacy work as well. We are there are approximately 2,700 people being housed across the state in the hotel voucher program. Approximately 255 of these people are being housed in seven motels right in the Barry Montpelier, Berlin area. I have talked to the poor and the homeless extensively over the years. And I have found through these conversations that I have had with them that affordable housing and sustainable housing is the biggest concern that keeps coming up in these conversations. We do don't need any more agencies or programs. There are enough of them. But what we do need as the poor citizens of Vermont is for the state to build affordable, sustainable housing. Repeatedly, people have asked why the state can't take some of these abandoned buildings and, and turn them into affordable housing or even purchase foreclosed houses and make them into affordable homes. 
what we would like to see in the state of Vermont from the Appropriations Committee is to take the needs of these poor Vermonters of the state into consideration when deciding to how to delegate these funds. Thank you. You'll be fine. Just tell your story. Yeah, that's yes. all people. That's what you do. Thank you. So Just much. be real, Iris. Just be real. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Iris Pepin, and I'm actually the newest member here. <laughs> so, <laughs> not professional like these ladies. <laughs> um, I have not been homeless as long as they have, but um, I get evicted illegally when the COVID operation first started happening, and um, I was. I had left an abusive relationship physically, mentally, and every other thing underneath. Um, I get disability once a month, $900. That's not enough to be paying for rent. My life, <laughs> basically. It's you guys that are helping us. Yes, and I'm very thankful for that. I, um, I wanna talk about mostly actually support animals. I have one. <laughs> too nervous for this. <laughs> I have one. Um, I have a sausage dog. She, he's my emotional support dog. <laughs> you can see, I need one. <laughs> um, a lot of the hotels and a lot of the, the apartments and everything are saying basically you choose your mental health, your physical health, or your bumming, um, you know, or your dog. My dog is my son, my four legged son, me and my husband. Raise, are raising him. He's there for me. He's there for my husband who has seizures. And I just wanted it out there that these aren't just pets. These aren't just, you know, oh, it's an animal who cares. They're there to support us and help us live. I've given up on life more than once. And having him there, I lived in my Jeep for quite some time. And my dog was the one that was there for me. He made sure I was safe. A little dog, but he made sure I was safe. <laughs> um, it, it, it's just, I'm not even sure, honestly. Like I said, I'm not a professional. I'm just somebody that says we, the money does need to be, be used for us to be able to, like, not all of us want what's given to us on a silver platter. We want to work, we want to help out, but it's not always possible for us to do that. We've got mental, physical, uh, any other spiritual, um, there, there's a lot of stuff that we need help with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And as much as you guys try, and I'm thankful for all you're trying, and I just wanna make sure you guys know that we're not the selfish type. We want you to know we're thankful that we're not out on the streets and we're, that we have a roof over our heads. Just try to think of us that need our support animals also. <laughs> um, and, um, and things and um, i guess as a quickly thank you <laughs> they're a part of our sustainable community yeah right? exactly <laughs> thank you iris there um i wanted to well um my name is tina Grayrand, and first of all i'd like to thank you for providing um iris and tammy and i with the opportunity to speak tonight um I am currently a hotel housed at the Pierre Motel in Barrie, Vermont. Uh, I am a single woman and prior to coming into hotel housing, I care took my um, premature grandson for two years to allow my daughter to work. Um, we, there were issues of affordable, safe childcare for my grandson. For two years, I took care of uh, Maxton. When I was done, um, I had not been employed and had no earnings and nowhere to live myself. And I came into the housing system. During my time in hotel housing, I have spoken with others that are in the same housing situation. What I can share with you tonight is that people are concerned about the end of housing, hotel housing, and where we will be. Issues that we feel need to be addressed are safe, safe, safe sustainable housing. Uh, transportation and uh, establishing the sense of community within our new housing situation 
is important for the success of new housing. The sense of community will help foster independent self-sufficiency and caring for the well-being of our neighbors. Transportation is a big issue to sustainable housing. Many that need assistance also lack transportation. This is one of the biggest downfalls for folks when they are housed. Many people worry about how they will be able to make it living on their own once they're in their own apartment and what support services will be available to assist in their success. We would appreciate working towards as much independence and self-sustainability as possible. We do not want to be dependent long-term on the system if it is not absolutely necessary. And I would really like to thank you again for giving us the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, part of becoming homeless is because feeling like you became invisible and silent. And we decided to start standing up to try to be seen and to be heard. And we're very grateful for the opportunity that Beth Ann provided for us tonight. And thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, there were some comments in the, or Sean, or do we have Sean still there or not? There were some comments that I wanted to um, pass along to uh, that were for Iris. I'm gonna have to take my glasses off to read these. Um, that said, uh, many of us have animals as a part of our families, we are with you. I have a PTSD support dog. I appreciate this testimony so much, so, so much. Iris, you are brave. Thank you for sharing your story. Sitting here with my dog, let me assure you that I hear you, Iris. So, and thank you, Tina and Iris and Tammy. Yes, everybody's lots of comments for you if you're not able to see those. And uh, let me add mine as well. Thank you so much. Um, we had, uh, Beth Ann, did, was, did, was Sean going to be there or do you know? Sean was not able to join us. I do have a poem from Sean that I might read at the very end of our okay. time Great. together. Great. Okay, uh, let's see, back to our questions. Let's see, where were we? Um, I know Senator Nicka, you were declining to answer. Um, Senator DeBallant, are you uh, up for an answer, yes or no, for these questions? <laughs> Well, I think Fred, um, we'll let, we'll just have the uh, questions read and I understand that the senators um, uh, don't want to just do a simple yes or no, but I think they do have other remarks that they'd like to make uh, at the end. So, um, so that's per certainly their prerogative. So why don't we, why don't we just read the questions and, um, and uh, then, then we'll let you, each of you have um, probably five minutes or so to, to, uh, to talk. So Marty, do you have a question one? Sure. There? Um, will you commit the funds needed to create 5,000 units of housing as soon as possible, and then fully fund the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board each year until we have created enough affordable housing to enable all our citizens to be permanently housed? Okay. Uh, Peter, you have our second question. Or Senator Nicka, did you want to comment? What be you're, you're muted, ma'am. I think I can't. I can no longer see on my screen where the mute and unmute are. They've disappeared. But anyway, um, I'm. I'm wondering, are we to remember all of the questions and then? Yeah. My. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator. They'll they'll be. We'll write them in the. Can you see them in the chat if they're presented to you in the chat? Uh, and you can, and then you can comment uh, all of when they're all finished. Okay. All right. Is that okay. Yep. Yes. Thank you, uh, Peter. Number yes. Two. The the second question is, how would you address racial disparity in housing distribution by fully funding a pathway for housing opportunities that is inclusive, accessible, and accommodating? 
And then uh, Nancy had question three. And this is, <clears throat> would you commit to fully funding S79 to establish a rental housing registry and inspection system throughout the state to ensure the safety of our rental housing stock? Okay, and then Sue, number four. Yes. Will you establish and fund a comprehensive plan to support all Vermonters experiencing homelessness, providing them with safe and humane emergency shelter and the economic and human service support that will allow them to achieve long lasting, stable, permanent and safe housing? Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, I suggest that we uh, give each of you five minutes to um, to talk. I think that that we um, our, our our timeline has sort of gotten thrown all out of kilter here. But I think five minutes should be a reasonable amount of time since we just have the two of you. Senator Ballant, do you want to go first? Sure, I'm happy to. So um, I took a lot of notes while um, I was listening to the stories and also um, while uh, thinking about the questions. And I think to speak to what Senator Nitka said at, at the top of, the, um, of our time together, we both sit on the Appropriations Committee, as I think you know, which is why we were invited here. And I just wanna say that the fact that the rest of the committee is not here does not mean they don't care about these issues. We've all been on Zoom for 12 hours today. And so we're, we're all, we're doing the best that we can. And so I just wanted to say that. Um, so as I said, I sit on the, the housing committee for the Senate and it has been one of my most uh, important issues for me personally as one of the reasons why I, I really ran for office to begin with. And one of the things that I've learned in sitting on that committee and putting a sizable amount of money towards building housing, which is I think what the focus has been with what, what you're talking about tonight. And I think that's important, but it only is part of the story because one of the things that we hear a lot in our committee is that we can house people, but if we do not put the right supports in place, those people easily lose their housing for a variety of reasons. And so I just made a quick list of all of the programs that we fund and support to actually keep people housed so they're not in that cycle. So supports making sure people have money so to, to fight evictions, down payment assistance to make sure that if there's a home available, they actually can scrape together the down payment and the closing costs, rent relief when they're about to be evicted, uh, wraparound services to keep people housed so that they have um, access to services around addiction or mental health services. So building the housing is only one part. It's an important part, but what we've learned is it actually doesn't solve the problem. And so the governor has a huge recommend in um, his plan for how to spend ARPA funds. And that is something that I know is very much in line with where the Senate and the House was coming into the session. We, we set aside a few really big uh, buckets of where we wanted to spend the money and housing was one of the, the largest investments that we wanted to make. So I'm actually feeling really uh, much more um, hopeful around this issue than I have for years because there is an understanding in a new way about, you know, the report talks to, up to things that we've been talking about for years in my committee, the very low vacancy rate. It used to be only in certain parts of the state. It's pretty much statewide right now. There's just not enough available housing, not just for people living at the margins, but across the economic spectrum. So you have this downward pressure. And so I'll just tell you a quick little story about my experience. I live in Brattleboro. I'm actually, I live around the corner from, from Fred. And uh, we live in a hundred year old house, you know, drafty house, like a lot of Vermonters, right? And we wanted to get a little bit bigger house because I've got two kids and a very rambunctious dog. We looked for a year and a half to find a house that was just a little bit bigger in town in Brattleboro so we could move out of our house and another family of more modest means can go into our house, which is much more of a financially available starter home as it were. And that house just wasn't available. So we gave up 
And I know there are other families in that situation. So the housing shortage is actually across the income spectrum, spectrum and it puts pressure downward. So we're thinking about those issues. Um, we're thinking about racial disparities, not just in housing, but also in incarceration, in you know, lots of, of criminal proceedings within our state. We're looking at health outcomes as it relates to um, black and brown women in Vermont and maternal health. And so it's difficult. And I know that this is, I think, where Alice was trying to get to is that when we say yes to certain things wholeheartedly without any sense of all the things that we're balancing, I don't want to have to show up in committee and tell the family that's come in to say, I can't get my son in a rehab program because there isn't a slot and there isn't funding. So those are the stories that we carry with us. We care deeply about this issue, which is why we are here. Uh, I absolutely support S79. It's actually been passed out of my committee several times. I hope the third time is a charm and we might actually get it through to the finish line because it is a barrier for us creating a real sense of where is the safe, affordable, uh, clean, healthy housing. And I don't know if Sue is, is she showing me that my time is out, up? I can't quite tell what's happening there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, because you keep fading in and out, so I couldn't tell. I thought maybe you were trying to say that. Um, the other thing that I want to say is to this issue of is it building housing or is it rehabbing houses, right? So we have a couple programs that we're doing that is also rehabbing units that have gone offline that we're bringing back online. And we're also looking to invest tens of millions of dollars in weatherizing old homes. So again, people can stay housed. So I know my time is up, so I will hand it off to my, <laughs> my colleague, Senator Nitka. But oh. um, we absolutely are here because we care about this issue and are fighting every day for those dollars. Right, and thank you, uh, thank, thank you for that, Senator Ballant. We, um, at the beginning, I, I spoke to that, you know, that we certainly know that you care and, um, and um, yeah, but you missed the, you missed my opening remarks there. So so I didn't know you cared, Fred. <laughs> that you cared that I cared. Now I knew that. Thank you for saying so. But um, also, and, and you also missed the uh, our our signals. The th the yellow thing is to give you tell you have a thirty seconds left. <laughs> so um, uh, th so thank you, Senator Nitka. You have uh, you need to unmute if you can find your unmute button. I found it. I also uh, have to apologize. I'm my Zoom station, so to speak, is underneath the stairs in my living room. And of course, the rest of my family is around here. And they're not being as quiet as as they might be. I guess I would have to say that. But anyway, um, just to go to the uh, Vermont Housing Conservation Board. So one of you're right for many, many years now, since whatever that bill was passed, um, the legislature has not withstood it and done something else with a portion of the money, which is used in the budget for a variety of, of things that are needing needed for people. The other thing is the um, if the whole bill, even if the whole amount was there, it's not just for housing, it's for conservation. And so they have through the years put a lot of money into um, conservation of land uh, on you know, and also, if you, of course, during Irene, the Conservation Board put a tremendous amount of money into many aspects of rehabilitating our state. And that, you know, it was a very appropriate use of the money. And so it's not just all for conservation. It would be nice if it could all go for just their jobs. But in fact, the how the legislature operates is the notwithstanding piece is there always. Um, you can, and also you can't bind other years legislators. In other words, they could do away with the whole bill some year if they wanted to do away with the whole program. It's not likely to happen because it's a great program. And uh, Gus Selig, who runs it, um, finds miraculous ways to team up with other agencies to get the housing done. I mean, it's, it's really very remarkable how many agencies and teams and nonprofits join with VHCB to do all kinds of housing rehabilitation, weatherization, all kinds of things. And I'm, I'm always amazed at how many other 
private and nonprofits uh, join with him to do this. So, and other state agencies. So I know one, one example of a great project is in Springfield where they rehabilitated, Springfield's had a very hard time. It was the old machine tool industry, which is all done. And it's a poor community. And they on the main street have rehabbed a big old brick structure with um, housing. And in the, something that's unique, that's something to look at is they've also had dedicated a certain number of the units to, um, to house children who were formerly in foster care. I have stuff going on here. Sounds like you're running a bar there, Alice. What's, what's happening over there? My grandson called on FaceTime or Facebook, whatever it is. <laughs> anyway. Oh, the pleasures of Zoom. That's right. But, um, you know, so they have start, they've done a program there, which I think we should all look at, which is housing for young people who have come out of foster care and don't have housing. And these are single room housing, very, very nice, I've been there to visit it, with a supervisor living on site and they have a communal kitchen and a communal living room. But it's, it's an excellent program because many of these young people are the homeless. Having been a social worker for many years, I had children on my caseload who later became homeless themselves. Um, you know, they had no longer a relationship with their birth family and didn't want to have one for many of them and wound up living homeless. I mean, some of them had lived behind the Holiday Inn in Rutland, which is a, a homeless encampment, generally speaking, although everybody's been housed at the Quality Inn nearby. And that's not going so well if you know what's going on in Rutland with um, Anyway, you know, they're, they're constantly going in, many of the people and not all of them have been going into Hannaford's. Hannaford has a policy that, you, you know, Hannaford staff said, we see the people coming, we know they'll come in here and steal. We can't put our hands on them, so they just go in and out. And it, it's made a disaster because now um, people in Rutland want them to move out of there. So the police have become involved, assigned some other people there to try and level things out and enable these people to remain there. On a very positive note, um, Neighborhood Works of Southern, of so, so Neighborhood Works of, they started in West Rutland, um, and they're also working in Burlington. I recently heard that of 100 homeless people, they have found permanent homes for 63 of them. I just heard this yesterday. So, you know, there is work being done and it's great. And I know your folks also are you know, doing so much for to work on this issue. Uh, let's see, went to another issue, I think. Remind me of some of the other questions here. Or am I all S done? S79, oh, I, you have 30 seconds. Oh, S79, never mind that one. You, you've addressed that. <laughs> what, what was another one you had? Um, uh, racial disparity in housing. Um, disparity. I mean, we are doing a lot of work in many areas on racial disparities and setting up programs to get data. The state, we've hired um, Susanna Davis as the racial equity, equity, racial equity um, director. I'm not sure of her exact title. And there's also another committee going, when we put a lot of money into, into people, she's able to hire a few people more. She works out of the administration um, and there's data collecting going on in a lot of areas. So somebody can say, yes, this is what's going on. This is exactly what needs to be addressed. And working with quite a few people in, in terms of racial equity across the board is a huge issue in terms of, obviously we've seen it with um, car stops, arrests, a, a lot of things going on there that there's a tremendous awareness right now in the legislature and around the state, I feel with regard to racial equity and what's not happening and should be happening. Um, well, thank you. Thank you both um, for your comments. I, you know, thinking that if we had had everybody here, um, we were gonna have to limit everyone to two minutes, which just seems like hardly anything. <laughs> so, but uh, we appreciate your, your um, being here and taking the time and our and the responsiveness to our uh, concerns. And I also wanted to thank uh, Tina, Tammy, and Iris again for sharing your stories. Um, and uh, we will have um, probably finish um, this evening with a 
poem that Sean also in the motel program had written. If, um, could I just could I just say one thing before you read Sean's poem? I appreciate oh, the information about the animals, and I know somebody who um, has been involved with animals for many years and and sheltering people who have them. And I'm going to be in touch with her to just see if she has some ideas for people in the in the Barry Montpelier area. Great, thank you. So, thanks. Um, uh, we wanted to encourage everyone else on the call though tonight to um, take part in our next steps. And uh, uh, the, same, the summary, the summary first. Okay. Well, the, I was going to say to help us frame um, what those might be. Um, the Reverend Joan Javier Duval was will do give us a summary uh, first. Joan. Great, and I'll just I'll just give ten seconds in case um, Carl happens to feel like he can do do the summary he was slotted to do it and i'm just gonna i can do it joan you can yeah. you feel yeah. all right taking it on yeah. sure okay we were having some behind the scenes but it sounds like carl actually is okay to let's spotlight carl all right <laughs> okay so this i'll wait for the spotlight to pop up yep you're, you're good. on okay so this evening we had the chance to gather as a people concerned about people, people struggling with access to safe and stable homes. And, and then we had this, this really amazing roll call where we got to remind ourselves that we're not alone, just to see where we are, people from all over the state, including guests right here uh, in Barry, Vermont, uh, who shared their stories. We've heard VIA's report regarding the situation of our neighbors, the 2,700, precariously housed Vermonters who are living in motels during COVID. We've heard about our historic underinvestment in housing due to 20 years of partially lost statutory funding. We've heard about Vermont's aging housing stock, the history of rents rising and vacancy rates dropping. We've been reminded that many motel residents have vouchers but can't find a place to rent. We've heard about the reality of systemic racism, which regarding housing, results in a disproportionate number of minorities experiencing homelessness. And we understand the legislature's need to address many well-supported concerns. And we believe that our first priority must be to ensure meeting the most basic needs of people, food, water, and safe shelter for all Vermonters. People in homes are healthier people, benefiting individuals in our broader community. And then we heard these stories from Tina and Tammy and Iris, and we're grateful for what you shared and for your lives. Uh, we're grateful for your courage to sh share your stories. Then we asked the questions of the legislators about committing funds to create 5,000 units of housing and to fully fund the Vermont Housing Conservation Board each year to address racial disparity and housing distribution by funding opportunities that are inclusive, accessible, and accommodating. We asked about fully funding S79 to establish a rental housing registry and inspection system, and then to establish and fund a plan for all Vermonters experiencing homelessness, providing safe and humane emergency shelter and services to achieve long lasting housing. So we then heard from senators, Becca Belent, who spoke of legislative priority to spend ARPA funds, the Senate support of 79, S79, and then a variety of other supports related to fighting evictions, down payment assistance, rent relief, wraparound services, and then working with new housing and housing rehab. And then uh, Senator Alice Nitka reminded us about VHCB's funding, not all going toward housing, but for conservation work as well, and talked about their extensive collaborative efforts and then told stories of her work in Rutland over the course of many years, um, and also the Senate's interest in addressing racial inequality through committees and staffing. So it leaves us uh, where we've gotten to hear all these stories, uh, heard research reporting, and, and so perhaps at least one of our next steps is this charge to all of us who are connected to Vermont Interfaith Action and its congregations and its mission. Let's continue to dream big and make it possible for every Vermonter to have a permanent, stable, and safe home. And let's keep close to our hearts and our actions, all of our precariously housed neighbors. 
it is possible to end homelessness in Vermont. It's within our grasp. We can make it happen. Thank you, Fred. Great, thank you, Reverend Carl. Um, and um, thank you all for um, coming again. Uh, thank you again for coming tonight. Uh, by being here, we have all demonstrated that we value a Vermont where every individual and family uh, has a safe, affordable place to call home and that we are willing to work together to make that vision a reality. I wanted to make um, two quick announcements before we end and then we'll have um, a closing reflection and the poem that uh, Beth Ann has from uh, from uh, Sean. So the two announcements, if you're not already involved with Vermont Interfaith Action and would like to learn more about us, please write interested in VIA in the chat along with your name and uh, one of our staff will contact you. And secondly, a reminder to the organizing committee to stay on to this Zoom call after everyone has left for a brief evaluation session of the evening's event. And now, um, Reverend, the Reverend Scott Cooper of Center Congregational Church in Brattleboro will lead us in a closing reflection. Good evening, everyone. For four years, um, I served uh, once as a crisis intake worker at a homeless shelter called the Haven of Rest. And the shelter was, unfortunately, when I first came there, a traditional old, uh, old time gospel mission. It did not take me long to discover that words of advice and appeal alone were uh, not at all effective. I learned that the feeding and the provision of shelter alone were woefully insufficient to restore self-worth, dignity, and most importantly, they failed to foster relationships that demonstrate love and affirmation. During the years I worked at the Haven of Rest, we turned this sort of old time mission into a transitional living facility, and we restored and renovated a, an abandoned building to do so. And to provide for the needs of the homeless, um, much advocacy had to be done. We had to appeal to all the local faith communities, the hospitals, especially the, the VA hospital, social workers, mental health providers, and most importantly, uh, we had to appeal to local and regional government representatives as we applied for national HUD funds. Many of you may also be aware that I served the church in Africa for almost 20 years. And there are sort of three African proverbs that summarize what I learned as a crisis intake worker so long ago. The first one is a child does not grow up only in a single home. Another proverb is a child belongs not to one parent. And last but not least, whosoever is not taught by a parent will be taught by the world. And all of these three African proverbs have sort of been conflated to the phrase, it takes a village. I think what we have discussed tonight is precisely that point. It takes a village. Thank you, Reverend Scott. Um, Beth Ann, would you like to leave us with uh, Sean's poem? So Sean is a gentleman that I met this afternoon. Um, and truly uh, has a powerful way of expressing 
what is happening in his poetry. Uh, he wasn't able to make it tonight. And I probably won't do justice to his poem the way he spoke it, but I'll try. And it's titled Drowning. Wish I would have done with what I had found fond. My thoughts, they caved. I didn't know how to make that bond. Twisted and deranged with what my life's been. Just knowing in my heart, it could happen again. Never been able to rid that pain. Fearing the worst could go insane. The trenches I've walked and met many. I surrender to you, my great spirit. Then one asks, can he? He said, yes, my son, he has not drowned yet. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Beth Ann. And um, thank you ever again. Thank you again, everyone, for um, being with us tonight. And have a good rest of your evening. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Do we yes, so I'm going to check off now. Is that right? Yes, you're, you're, you're fine. Thanks a lot. We appreciate it. Yes. Thank you very much. And Debbie, could you send me the, uh, email me the um, list? Of Absolutely. And Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll send you the report. Uh -huh. yes. uh, report. Thank you. Thank you.